Hi, everybody, and welcome to Good Vibes FC. I am Sam Lewis, and I'm coming to you live from, well, it's not live, it's recorded, but I'm coming to you from the women's game headquarters, Boston office, a.k.a. my little living room office. And I'm Lynn Williams, coming to you from New Jersey, where Marley just set up this super official podcast PC situation, and then naturally, right as we were about to record, I got up and ruined it, so he had to come back in and set it up again. We want Marley. He's out there. He'll come in. He'll make an appearance one day. Okay, Lynn. Well, we had a big weekend this weekend. And by we, I mean me. (laughs) I went down to North Carolina. It was NWSL opening weekend. And I was inducted into the ring of honor by the North Carolina Courage. It was like so lovely. I know all the pictures and videos looked so wholesome. Um, I was so sad I couldn't be there. But how was it? Like, tell me. It was really, really nice. Um, I went down on Thursday and I got to have dinner with the team and I like awkwardly stood up like a bunch of people made speeches like Kurt Johnson, the GM, and then Sean Nahas, the head coach. And then I like awkwardly like rattled my chair around and was like half squatting. And I was like, "Um, can I say something too? And it was like so awkward. (laughs) And then I basically just like said thank you. And I said to the team who... I know probably like half of them, but like literally had never met half of them before in my life. And I gave them some unsolicited advice, which I'm prone to doing. And I basically just said that I wish I had known that I was in the prime of my career when I was in it. And it was really the time that I was in North Carolina. And to imagine that every opportunity they have is like the best opportunity that they're going to have when whether that's they're starting or they're coming off the bench or whatever it is. Like imagine that this is the prime and think about how much you would enjoy and be present if it was, because I just kind of felt like it flew by. And now that my career was like cut a little bit short, I wish I had like known that those were going to be the good old days. Do you know what I mean? I do. Well, I don't, but I do. (laughs) Um, Did you feel like so I don't even know the word. Like, how how did it feel being back in North Carolina, though? Was that the first time you've been back since? Yeah. Yeah. Since, like, 2021, when I was last playing for the team. Um, it was really cool. I feel like Raleigh has changed a lot. That, that North Hills area where mm-hmm. we used to go to, like, Bar Taco and a couple of other places. Oh, I saw you were at Bar Taco. I was so jealous. I was at Bar Taco. There's also a new Jubala at North Hills. Okay. Which is one of my favorite coffee shops in North Carolina. And the team lives around there now. So it was like such a great area and so much fun. And then I I even got to go to practice on Friday. And Mm -hmm. even like just being out there at that field where we always used to train and do extra running. I (laughs) do extra running. And (laughs) we did a lot of running when you were there. I just feel like I could tell that the culture of the team is very much the same. And Mm -hmm. this is going to be my other kind of deep thought. It's like I had never really thought about legacy. Yeah. And when I got back to North Carolina and I felt that the culture of the team was very much still, we work really hard here and we always put the team above ourselves. The fact that you can tell that it's important to all of those girls who most of whom we never played with, I actually felt like our group at the courage did leave that legacy there. And I felt really proud of that. And I wanted to tell you that. And I want to tell some of our other former teammates that because I had never really considered what legacy we might have left behind. And I feel really proud that I think that's what we gave to the club. That makes my heart like happy, but also sad. I think it's bittersweet, like talking about North Carolina. Obviously, I don't play for them anymore. And a lot of us don't play there anymore. And I think there are these moments where it's just time to move on. Nothing I don't have a bad thing to say about the club right now. I think at the past I might have, but right now I think that to know that you leave a legacy and leave, like North Carolina is always going to have a special place in my heart. And I think yours as well. I think that when I think about the times there, it's about, we like grew up together. Like yeah. we came from Western New York and then we're able to build this like incredible dynasty before COVID, before all of the the drama, for lack of better words. Um, and it's just really cool that 
that continues to be there. I almost get sad sometimes even just being on um, Gotham because I see all these younger players doing that with their team, like being able to come into the club and 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 build and grow. And I'm excited to see what legacy they leave. But to hear that just kind of makes me so happy and also a little like, oh. I know. It was like very nostalgic. I think yeah. something else, and this will be like my last emotional speech that I will try to do today. But I spoke in the stadium. Um, mm -hmm. There was like this beautiful ceremony. They had my jersey framed. Uh, Kurt again spoke. Sean spoke. And then Denise O'Sullivan spoke. Yeah. And then I spoke. And again, like the announcer had kind of like wrapped things up, but like <laughs> I was supposed to speak, but I had to kind of be like, oh, like awkward again. Like I have to go get the microphone and be like, I actually, everybody hang on. I have something to say. And I think what I really was trying to convey there, I have no idea how I did because I was like sobbing uncontrollably in, the, in front of everybody <laughs> at the stadium on the microphone. But I was trying to say that like, what I learned in North Carolina and how I want to take that with me into my life moving forward. And what I learned was seeing players like Ryan Williams and Kaylee Kurtz, who when we played with them, didn't start and hardly ever got minutes and they worked their way and they mm -hmm. started on Saturday for the courage. I was like, I, that's what the courage is. When things are hard, you work hard and you make the most of it and you hold yourself accountable and you grind and you figure it out. And those lessons that Ryan and KK showed me in my return to North Carolina, I want to take that. That's how you respond to adversity. That's how you reveal your character is when things get hard. And I also said, Lynn, similar to what you were saying before, the club did that too. The club had a really hard moment. They took accountability. They were honest and they fixed things. And the way the club treated me when I was there, the, how professional they are how far they've come. I was so proud to see that response to a difficult moment. And I just, when I retired, I announced my retirement and Kurt called me, Kurt Johnson, the GM, he called me six days later. And I'm like, that's a response to a really hard moment of being like, we are going to do the right thing in this really hard time. And it was just something I was like, I want to take whatever the courage has and like bring it with me in the rest of my life because it's so special and honest and it's like such an incredible way to respond when things are hard yeah it's like infectious i feel like i don't know i just the courage will always have a special place ctid even though i'm on gotham <laughs> ctid courage till i die but also gotham till i die as well I know, I know. Go bats. <laughs> I'm, no, I'm so happy that you got that experience. And I think that it was so deserved. You just had such an incredible mark on the courage. And I think that the legacy that you left, it, it's like you can't even put it into words. Um, I wish that those girls were able to see you. Or I hope they were able to come to games, but able to like see you in your prime. Um, I feel very lucky. I said this to you a million times that I was able to play with you. Um, and just, I don't think you even realize like the impact you've had on the game, the impact you've had in North Carolina. So it is awesome to see that you are the first inductee into the Ring of Honor. Well, thank you, Lynn. I feel like I could keep talking about this forever and just, you know, telling all my own stories. But <laughs> I think we need to get to the rest of the podcast. So the NWSL is back. Speaking of, we've seen all the teams play just one game. So naturally, we're going to judge them all with a description slash stereotype that they'll just never escape from. Every team this week has an alter ego. We are going to figure out what candy they are. Lynn, do you like that? Yep. Let's do it. I have a list of candies right here. Oh, my gosh. Amazing. So Lynn and I also have alter egos. You, So you are currently listening to a nerd's rope. That's me because I'm long and nerdy. Oh, um, I want to be, um, I want to be a Reese's. I don't really have a reason. I just love them so much. They're also brown and I'm brown. Lynn is just good vibing her way with the alter egos and I freaking love it. Yeah. There's no reason. <laughs> For no reason. Just because I wanted it to be. Today on the show, we are going to cover the Challenge Cup. Uh, San Diego Wave won the Challenge Cup thanks to trophy queen Alex Morgan. Bay FC made history. And so did Kansas City. Their new stadium debuted with a nine-goal thriller. There was sock drama in the Women's Super League in England. Plus, the race at the top is tight with only six games left now, and we will discuss 
comments made about player coach relationships from future national team coach Emma Hayes. And we will take an email from Robin about all of these freaking tournaments and how hard that is on the players. Let's get into it, Lynn. Let's do it. First up, the Challenge Cup kicked off and also finished on Friday night. <laughs> Very short cup. <laughs> I know. Can we even call it a Challenge Cup? Like, we should have renamed it. I know, right? You know, want to know something Mary Speck said to me this weekend in North Carolina? She was like, we we won it two years in a row and we didn't even get a chance to defend our title. And I was like, dang. Well, they should have won it three years in a row. <laughs> I don't know. I That's a great point. I, I don't know. know how they came to this agreement because for everybody who is listening and new, the Challenge Cup last year was a, a months. It was months. And you played yeah. in regions. You had groups. And then, you know, tournament style. I don't know why I started to explain it. And then I just did it. You're like, I'm going to just you do my best with memory here. But basically, the Challenge <laughs> Cup this year is very different. It's only a one game cup between the championship winners and the shield winners from last year. So Gotham so is basically like the community shield. Yes. Is what it was. Exactly. The community shield is this very similar one game <laughs> cup in England. <laughs> Anyways, we're going back on track. Championship winners, Gotham FC took on shield winner San Diego wave at Red Bull stadium in New Jersey in front of a packed house. This was a Gotham home game. Second largest crowd ever with 14,000 plus fans. Lynn, what was the vibe like? Yeah, I thought it was awesome. Um, I like called one of my friends before the game started to get her a ticket and she was in the parking lot and I was like, I can't hear you. Like the crowd was just so loud. She's like, the parking's crazy. I don't know what you're saying. And I was like, I can't hear you either. So to take that and put it into the stadium, I thought that just the vibes were amazing. Good vibes, if you will. Hey. It's just incredible to see i feel like this club the history of this club has been working so hard to get a crowd like that um hopefully we can continue this on for the rest of the season but i feel like fourteen thousand people is what this club deserves what the players deserve to play in front of them hopefully we can just increase that number as we go i know that's amazing um before we get to the game there was a big sad face emoji that went with this game because lynn you're on the injury report with i know boo a thigh problem. What's going on? And how bummed were you to miss the game? I know. Um, I was really bummed. I obviously being away from international duty, want to be able to come back and play and just integrate with the team. And when you're injured again, you feel like removed, um, like doing rehab, just mm -hmm. not with everybody. So that's been really annoying. Um, so funny. It says thigh because even when it was my MRI, they were like, we're getting a thigh MRI. And I was like, I really feel like this is my hamstring, but sure. Um, so anyways, I just strained my hamstring. Um, I'll be back soon. Um, nothing too serious. I'm really happy that it's not a serious injury. And I'm on the mend. Well, Lynn, we miss you every single time that you aren't out there. And Gotham missed you too. The match was pretty evenly matched. A little pun there. It all came down to one woman. The, of course it was her of the NWSL. That's Alex Morgan in the 88th minute when everyone, myself included, was expecting it to go straight into penalties, which is a wild format, but that's challenge cup for you. Alex scored a header after pretty deftly losing her mark off a corner kick crossed in by Savannah McCaskill, who is new on the San Diego wave this year. Lynn, how do you feel about the loss? What was it like from the angle you were watching from? What are your thoughts on the game? Yeah, I Obviously, we're not happy that we lost. I feel sad for the girls just knowing how much work that they've put in this preseason. First of all, being able to watch a game from so high up, as you know, it's very different than when you're on the field. As you're watching high up, you're like, it's so simple. Why don't you pass the ball there? <laughs> but on the field, you're obviously seeing different things. You're, you're, the feeling and the emotions are different. I thought that watching we had a lot of opportunities to score i felt like we kept possession well our keeper made a couple big saves to keep us in the game and unfortunately we just lost our mark on a on a set piece and i think that that's something we need to continue to look at because set pieces we've always said that win and lose games and unfortunately for us it lost our game but fortunately for us we are now going into something new so that because that's like a one game off situation we can um, turn our focus into the season. Yeah, exactly. I, I was kind of curious because that game doesn't count towards league standings. Mm -hmm. How like important was it to your team? Like how high were the stakes? 
Well, I think that any time that you could uh, play for a cup, play for a title, even if it's just one game, um, it's important. I I think everybody wants to put more trophies in their in their case. So, um, but at the same time, like you have to have a short term memory. Like yeah, like we said, it's it's not this. Okay, we can make it up here. We can make it up there. Like that's a whole separate situation and now it's over so we have to just like move on yeah for sure that's like a ted lasso be a goldfish reference i think that's from season one which i love um (laughs) it does kind of strike me as an opportunity to like kind of have a warm-up game but it still Mm -hmm. kind of baffles me like i i see both sides of this i'm so curious about crystal didn't start sonnet didn't start jenna didn't come in until late in the second half You all had seven players away with the U.S. Women's National Team at Gold Cup. You and Rose Lavelle were injured. Tierna Davidson started at center back, and Midge Purse also started. She played great. But my question is, why not start Crystal? Why not start Sonnet unless they're on a minutes restriction? I don't expect you to, like, answer this, but I feel like your coach has a difficult thing to grapple with right now. All those players have been away, and he's been training with another training group. But at the same time, international players can't be like punished for having camp. That's also their duty and it's an honor to go in. And I'm just really curious how Gotham is going to handle this dynamic moving forward. All these great players that helped win the championship last year who are regularly training with the team. And then potentially seven plus of you who will be gone on future FIFA windows, be gone for the Olympics. I want to know how the dynamic is coming back into camp and maybe a little bit what you can share about what it's been like coming back in with the group. Yeah, I don't envy Juan Carlos right now in his decisions. I think that on one hand, it's amazing the the caliber of players that we have and the depth of our team. I think that to go far in anything, a season, a tournament, whatever, you have to have depth. And I think that our team has that. On the other hand, I think that you have to manage it correctly um, to – keep people happy, but also just the management of people going in and out. People yeah. have been here. Like the whole thing is just nuts. Um, I also see both sides. I think that one coming off of a long tournament, um, maybe there was minutes restrictions. I obviously don't know everybody's individual plan, yeah. what's going on there. But at the same time, when it comes to Challenge Cup, you also have people who have been here from last year who got the job done in and not only the challenge cup but also um in the championship game they've been here every single day they they know the system um how do you not reward those people at the same time yeah so again i don't know the answer i don't i just think that i do not envy him um and i think it will be exciting but also difficult in times moving forward I know it is so interesting. I think there are clearly like two cases to be made. Um, I did just want to say, I thought Delaney Sheehan played really great. Mm -hmm. Um, I think you guys on Gotham have like so many incredible players and I am very excited to see you all mesh and come together and get some results soon. We need to give you guys Gotham, your alter ego candy. Ooh, Gotham would be. I Uh go. I want to name Gotham. You guys are the three musketeers because my three best friends are on the team. Oh, that was so cute. You and Rose and Sonnet. That was really cute. We'll keep that then. My girls. But then I'm not in that, but I guess I'm not on the team. (laughs) (laughs) You just get to get us all and you can like keep a little bowl of us at home. I just get to eat it. What is eating our friends? (laughs) What is San Diego's candy? I don't know. San Diego's something that you just ruin people's day. Because they ruined ours. You ruined people's day. You know what they could be? They could be little chocolate chips. Like when you drop a chocolate chip when you're sitting on the couch and then it melts and it stains the couch. Not calling anybody out for doing that. I don't know who would ever do that. That was so ridiculous of them to do that. Yeah, they're chocolate chips then. Fine. Because you also <laughs> love them. You love them, but then they, they ruin their day. You love them, but they can ruin your couch and ruin your day. Okay. I did not ruin the couch. I cleaned it up. Okay. After Friday night's match, the NWSL officially kicked off with regular league play with the Kansas City Current hosting the Portland Thorns on Saturday. I have to just tell you guys, this game seemed like headline after headline. I thought I was doing my journalistic duty and being like, this is the storyline of this game. We're going to get to all of that. But it started 
With the commemoration of the first ever NWSL exclusive stadium, apparently the Kansas City airport was covered in current logos. Everyone all around town was draped in teal. Tons of excitement, tons of momentum for the team. I feel like this in our back in our day, Lynn, and I'll speak for myself, like Portland, the Thorns were the standard. They had the great stadium and all the fans and they were treated super professionally. And I feel like now Kansas City, it's a grass pitch. It's their own stadium. It was a sellout crowd. The whole city seemed involved. Is this the new standard? And do we expect more clubs to create environments like this? Yeah, I think that one, the fact that it's a it's made for women. Um is incredible. I think that historically women have always had to go into men's stadiums, into men's facilities and, and rent space from them. So the fact that, that these women are able to go somewhere that's their home, I think you take pride in that. We talked about this on the last podcast, but it's not an advantage, but it's just like a pride thing. You're like, I am going to be so proud to be in this stadium, have my space, represent this, this logo. I'm speaking obviously as if I was a Kansas City person. <laughs> um, and I just think it's amazing. I think that if you have a professional team, you want to promote and make it the best. So it's awesome. I saw that they had it on like their train too. Yeah. the Like they decked out all the seats. I just thought it was incredible. Who doesn't want that? It's uh, awesome. I know. So I'm like, here's this headline, the stadium. That's going to be what everybody talks about about this game. Yeah. Then I'm like seeing Dabinha and Bia, the Brazilian combination out there. And I'm like, no, no, no. This is what everybody's going to be talking about. Yeah. Then Vanessa Bernardo scores a brace. And I'm like, oh my God, Kansas City is going to like kill Portland. Then I'm like, Bia Zanarato scores a goal. Welcome to the league. That's the story. Janine Becky returns to the field. She scores a brace. What an amazing story. Sophia Smith scores a brace. Then the youngest player ever scores for Kansas City. Alex Pfeiffer at 16 years, three months and 20 days old. Basically, what? to sum it all up, the headline is just, this was the craziest game ever. 11,500 people, sellout crowd, opening stadium, both Mahomes in the stands. Vlatko's first game and a 5-4 to four win for the current. Like, the headlines from this game are endless. I know. Also, <laughs> the fact that two people can score braces and your team loses, that's a headline in itself. It's wild. It it like reminds me of when we played in Western New York in 2016 when it was like we got scored on all the time, but we just scored one more goal than them. Yeah. And it was like, it doesn't matter. We were were winning games from in Western New York like six to three. And we were like, I don't know. Exactly. Or like, I was like, it's five to two. It's (laughs) seven to one. And I'm like, I don't know what's going on, but sure. Just as long as you score one more goal, it doesn't matter, I guess. It was mayhem, but I feel like it was like such a great show for the Kansas City crowd. And honestly, like we, we can't sit here and say that the defenses were like locked down. Obviously there was a bunch of goals given up at both ends, but like it was a really exciting game. Did you have any like major takeaways? Kansas City is obviously building some kind of crazy culture there and I think that that is like the biggest takeaway is is that it's not just a place that players want to play but it's a place that fans want to come and watch players play and I think that that is what I got from like watching the game I was like this is exciting yeah it's awesome I think for that reason exactly the current are a payday because that's how you need to be spending your money on your team by just building that stadium I won't accept anything less at this point and then Portland for today is going to be a double bubble because they scored two goals from two people. A double bubble. That's a double bubble. I love that. I know Sophia Smith hasn't really been doing her bubble braid anymore, but I also like maybe someday she'll get it back and it'll be double bubble again. It's just a little double bubble. Oh my God. That was a really good one, Lynn. I love that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Then on Sunday, there was another debut match. Bay FC beat Angel City in their opener on an Oshawala goal. I thought... To score this goal, Bay had really good pressure on the ball. Caprice Didasco kind of forced a turnover on a back pass and then Tess Bode intercepted it, passed to Oshwala. Oshwala scored an awesome goal. Like, I think just receiving the ball from where she did, the pressure that was on her, the finish. I'm always so impressed when people score goals, like, high up in the air because I felt like I only ever scored on the ground. Otherwise, I would, like, kick it over. Um, Oshwala came to Bay from Barcelona where she was the fourth highest goal scorer in club history, a two-time Ballon d'Or nominee, huge signing for Bay FC coming into the league. I think that she's such an effective player. She's really strong. She's really fast. So it's hard to 
mark her back to goal because she can hold players off, but it's also hard to mark her running in behind because she's so fast. That's just so hard to stop. We played against Barcelona when I was at Man City and I kind of was like, oh, like, I don't think that we can stop her. Like, she's just kind of inevitable. How did you feel watching her play? Yeah, I thought that, first of all, her goal or just the team, I'm going to call it a team goal um, because I really felt like it was just like high pressure, um, but her ability to just recognize where she is on the field and almost like surprise the keeper. I feel like a lot of people would have taken a touch and then tried to place it, but she just recognized where she was on the field and she touched on this at halftime, um, just instinctually shoot it. Um, but I thought she was great. I thought that, um, like you said, her ability to hold up and she's a strong player. Um I do want to shout out though Sarah Gordon. I do feel like besides that, um, she was able to match her speed and just kind of like shut her down the rest of the game. Um, so yeah, I, I do think that it's even though she had a great game, I do think it's gonna still take her a second to to learn the speed of the NWL and how transitional mm-hmm. it is. It's like a very different league. Um not to say that she didn't do great, but I do think it's gonna take a, a little bit more time for us to see like all of the things that she can do. Yeah. And I, especially, I think just being part of an expansion team, I'm sure there will be bumps in the road. Um, But it was such a great start for Bay FC. I'm really excited for them. Disappointing for Angel City though, coming off such a strong tail end of their season last year, they actually had an 11 game unbeaten streak when Becky Tweed took over as interim head coach last year. And they had so much momentum, but I similar to your game, actually, Lynn, they lost one to nothing. It's not ideal, but it's a long season. And like, how much can you really read into one game? I don't know. I feel like they're going to be disappointed. Um, just coming off of last year, you don't want to lose your home opener. Um, they had a lot of possession as well. It was like almost like there was a force field around Bay FC's goal. I was like, <laughs> why? There was two times I was like, I cannot believe that ball didn't go in the net. <laughs> yeah. um, but... So I think on that hand, there's going to be – there's a lot of room for growth. It's going to be exciting. I think they just need to sharpen up in a couple places. So we'll see. But I don't think that you can look at one game and say, oh, it's it's over. Like you just have to keep going. It's it's game one. But I also think that we've said this before. Sometimes while you – when you get into a really long season, the games in the beginning really matter. So um, I guess we'll see. I guess we will see. We need to assign candy bars – to these two teams, Bay and Angel City Lynn. I'm going to let you go first this time so I don't steal the easy one. Oh, okay. Is it easy? I don't know. I'm just going to riff off of you. Okay. Well, Angel City is going to be a bougie candy. Oh, yeah. Like Ferrero Rocher. Fancy. I don't even know what that... Exactly. I don't even know what that is. They're like those gold-wrapped like hazelnuts with like a layer of chocolate oh, and, like, and they're yes. like very fancy. Like you'd get them at like a museum, I feel like. Yes. A truffle candy, if you will. Sure. I, I will. That's what they are. That's what Angel City is, is a Ferrero Rocher. Bay yeah. FC, I'm going to call them a fast break. Ooh. They got that team up. They got some fast players. They scored a goal on a turnover and a... Do you have a, like a candy list of like old candies? Like what's... I feel like when I'm thinking of candies in my head, I'm like a Twix, a Snickers. I know. We do need to get Twix in here. Like a, what's a very layered... We'll have to put it to a very layered team. Yeah, but you're like, anyways, a fast break. I love it. Well, Ferrero Rocher is a random (laughs) one. I will give you that. Okay, last few things on this weekend. Seattle Rain beat the Washington Spirit 1-0 on a Bethany Balser PK in the literal opening seconds of the game, which I thought was so wild, like, for the ref to call. Like, obviously, it was a PK, but it was seven seconds into the game, and I was like, oh, my gosh, like, how? First of all, after Saturday's game, weekend of craziness i was like sunday is going to be a calmer games and then in seven seconds a pk was called and i was like what is going on so i wanted to talk really quick bethany balser scored the pk for seattle that went on to be the game winning goal uh she was also a recent guest on our interview podcast friendlies if people haven't listened to that yet i really recommend it bethany's really open about her relationship with mental health and She had said that before the game yesterday, she had a lot of anxiety. She didn't feel like she had a good warm up. She couldn't calm down. Um, And then I'm going to read some of her posts from Instagram. She said, I reminded myself that I am capable and have the skills to be here on the field today. I knew this was a moment where I could succumb to my anxiety or push through it. Everything leading me up to this moment told me I couldn't do it. 
but I knew leaning into it was the only way I could overcome it and not let it have power over me. Miss or make, I knew that taking the penalty would remind me that I do not have to let my anxiety control everything I do. Here's just a reminder that you can struggle with anxiety and still be successful. And making that PK does not define my success. Lean into the uncomfortable and you will find a great strength about yourself that can carry you further than you know. I feel like this is so insightful and amazing to share. I think somebody in Bethany's position who does deal with anxiety and is really working to overcome it and not let it define what she can or can't do on the field. I'm like just so blown away by her openness and vulnerability to share this. Yeah, I feel like it's really bold. It's very open of her. I like the part the most where she talks about her taking the penalty and how she's like, I, me having anxiety it doesn't matter if I make this or if I if I miss. It's just not letting the anxiety control me. I think that there are moments in our lives where we feel so like trapped by something. And she's saying like, I have anxiety, but I'm still able to do all these things. I'm still able to play at this incredibly high level. I feel like it, this is great for somebody who might be new or might have anxiety and or might just might be new to the league. That's like, yeah, who's anxious, who's like, I feel like I'm the only one who goes through it and you're not. I know. I feel like it's her saying my anxiousness isn't restricting me. Like I have worked to be able to play with it. Mm -hmm. And I just find that so powerful. I mean, I like get anxious all the time too, as you know. And I think that Bethany's approach of saying not only does this success of whether this PK goes in or not, that doesn't define me as a person Having anxiety doesn't define what I'm capable of. Um, I just think it's like so amazing of her to share this. And I'm, I wanted to share it on this podcast because I'm think it's important for people to hear. I agree. I'm happy that you shared that with us. Thank you so much. You're so welcome, Lynn. Another big moment this weekend was the return of Mallory Swanson to the Chicago Red Stars. She played 81 minutes after her really difficult knee injury last year before the World Cup. And her team, Chicago, won 2 to nothing against the new Utah Royals at Utah's home opener. I'm going to share another Instagram caption, believe it or not, because Mal, very heartfelt, posted to Instagram, after 343 days, three surgeries, and an infection that changed my whole perspective on life, I realized many things. Life is a beautiful blessing. Health is a blessing. This game that I love is a blessing. And at the end of it all, I am more than thankful to be able to do what I love again. I am so glad that Mal's back. This must have been so hard for her. And it was just such a joy seeing her back out on the field. I agree. I obviously both of us have had injuries, um, lengthy ones. And I just think that like you go into an injury thinking it's going to go so smooth. There's a timeline. There's everything. And I think that you quickly learn you just got to throw that timeline out the window. And you just get so thankful to be able to walk again, run again. In Mal's case, she had an infection. Like, I don't know how bad it was, but like li- literally just live. So um, it was. I thought that she played with so much joy in that game. You could just tell how excited she was to be out there. She looked good. She looked sharp. Um, so I'm just so happy for her. I know. What is, what's Mel like? Like, can you tell everybody like what she's like as a person? <laughs> she's like very chill, but also so bubbly yeah um and then when she gets on the field she turns into a crazy person like she's just so passionate about playing that you're like you're crazy when I think about Mal like somehow like just gumbying her way to the goal I'm like (laughs) how did you do that how did you do that um but yeah she's like chill she's fun she's always down to have a good time a good laugh what are your thoughts about Mal (laughs) Mal is just the best. She's just the sweetest. Do you think that she's like a total game changer for Chicago? They had a tough year last year. They did come in last place, but now they have Mal back. I do. I think that she's going to bring a a leadership role to the to the game. Um, I do think that sometimes it is hard to just expect one person is going to be able to change every single thing that's happening. But I do think that she has, she just has a presence about her, a seniority-ness about her, which is crazy to think because she is so young. Yeah. Um, but I just think that she's going to, almost like a standard, a standard that she's not going to let drop, um, yeah. which I feel like Chicago needs. 
I agree. I mean, I think that Chicago, obviously they had a tough year last year and then they lost some really key players like Casey Kruger, Aaron Wright. So they're in a tough spot. They do have a new owner. And I think if anybody can influence that team positively, it's Mal. They won their first game. So here we go. I'm going to call the Red Stars. I want to call them like gummy bears because like, I don't know, maybe it's like the Chicago Bears is in my head, but I just feel like they're very like we've yet to determine the flavor. What are those like round, chalky candies? Whoppers? Nope. They're like um, snow caps, non-parels. What what kind of candy list are you looking at? What is that? I'm not even looking at a list. I have all this in my stored in my brain. They're chalky, and you get them in can like you get them at um Halloween. Anyways, they're that because it's dry there, <laughs> and you- <laughs> they are mystery candy that's chalky. We got it. Yeah, people are gonna know what I'm talking about. Also, congrats, Utah. Also. <laughs> I, I know we haven't been doing this for people, but I think that Alyssa Nair needs a shout out. And she, her candy is a lifesaver because I don't know what she took that morning, but her saves. I was like, Alyssa, what? Classic Alyssa. Lifesaver Classic Alyssa. Alyssa. But um, I just, again, I need to shout out. I if The fact that she was able to run forward, then run back, and then tip the ball over the bar, I feel like a lot of keepers would just swat it back into the mix. But she was like, no, I got to put this out of bounds. I was just impressed. That's all I'm saying. I am so glad that you shared that with us. That's a listener for you. But it is time now for the Olipop Gut Check of the Week, brought to you by our friends at Olipop. This week's Gut Check, Lynn, which NWSL team looked best in their opening game and why? I'm going to go first. Go. North Carolina. I think there was a lot of teams that looked good this weekend. It's only been one game. But who had the most convincing win? And whose game was I there watching in person? North Carolina. I was going to say real original. Real original of you. They won 5-1. to one. I am... People... Ashley Sanchez is going to have a good year. You heard it here first. Maybe you didn't hear it here first. I think maybe other people are anticipating that too. She looks really dangerous. Really good. I love the way North Carolina's team keeps possession of the ball and then like turns the attack on at the right time. I thought Tyler Lucy looked really dangerous down the wing. Haley Hopkins scored a great toe poke goal wearing number five, by the way, Bianca St. George had a brace coming in off the bench. I think they had a lot of great pieces and I honestly do no bias. Think that it was the most complete team win on the weekend. I agree. First of all, do you think that it was a coincidence that they scored five goals the weekend where you used to wear number five i'm not saying that it was or wasn't a coincidence (laughs) um but i agree i felt like there were some other teams that offensively i was impressed with but defensively i think they need to sharpen it up and i think north carolina was the most complete looking team this weekend so i got excited when they were going forward and defensively i thought that they made some big plays they were sound and We, again, shall see how it goes for the rest of the year. That was the Olipop Gut Check of the Week. Thanks again to our friends at Olipop. Let's hop across the pond, and we will take a look at what's going on in England's WSL, the Women's Super League. As of right now, there are only six matches left to decide the title winner, and the top of the table is tight. Tied for first are two big clubs that everybody knows the names of, Chelsea and Manchester City. They both have 40 points. Now in a distant third is Arsenal on 34 points who lost to Chelsea this weekend and they did it in a weird fashion. Chelsea won three to one with three first half goals, but to make matters worse for Arsenal, they did it while Arsenal were wearing Chelsea's socks. Lynn, dun, what? Dun, dun. <laughs> yeah. Um, apparently Arsenal showed up with white socks. Um, but Chelsea also had white socks, so you can't have the same colored socks. <laughs> um, so believe it or not, the socks color is registered in advance. The International Football Association law states the two teams must wear colors that distinguish them from each other and the match officials. So they were wearing the wrong socks, guys. Yeah. So when they found out that they had the wrong color socks, the match got delayed while somebody from Arsenal's team went to the Chelsea team store, 
bought Chelsea's away socks that were on sale at the store for their whole team. And then Arsenal comes out a half an hour late in gray and blue Chelsea socks with the logo taped over. This sounds so wild and bizarre. Lynn, do you think that the, an equipment issue like this would have like gotten in Arsenal's head and messed them up? Okay, well, first of all, what if there wasn't socks for sale? Like then what were they going to do? I don't know. I like, mean, like gone to the nearest soccer good good store. So, <laughs> I I think this is a wild story. Um, I don't. I, this is wild. I just don't believe that this would ever happen on the men's side. I don't know what happened. The poor equipment manager probably feels so bad. Um, but I don't know if it would get in your head. I I think that at on some level, sure. Like, just the whole rigmarole of, like, oh, we yeah. have the wrong socks, and oh, we have to wear the other socks and tape over them. Like, it, I just feel like it was, like, not what you'd want to be focusing on before the biggest game. Not blaming Agreed. the kit manager of Arsenal for anything, but, like, obviously not an ideal way to start your biggest game against Chelsea. I couldn't agree more. Obviously, we have played in games where there's been delays for various reasons. Um, obviously, the game was pushed back a half an hour. That does, though, affect your game preparation in when do you start activation? You, you've you already eaten True. for a, a certain amount of time before. You're thinking like three hours before the game starts, I'm going to eat something. So now yeah. that that's pushed back a half an hour, players might be thinking, how do I get the energy back? Um, but I, I don't know. I think that you kind of just got to like roll with the punches. I know. It's definitely tough. Um, I'm going to call this one sock gate. And Arsenal's loss here, a.k.a. Sockgate, basically took them out of the title race. So we will be very actively now watching Man City, who have internationals like Bunny Shaw and then England players like Lauren Hemp and Chloe Kelly and Chelsea, who have Katarina Macario and soon-to-be women's national team manager Emma Hayes as this season in the WSL draws to a close with a very tight race at the top. Speaking of Emma Hayes, she did make some comments earlier this week that you may have seen in headlines, so we wanted to talk a little bit about that. This week, Leicester City suspended their manager due to allegations of a relationship with a player that they are now investigating. And when asked about it at a press conference, Emma initially said, player-coach relationships, they're inappropriate. Player-to-player relationships are inappropriate. But we have to look at it in the context of where the game has come from and say, look, we're in a professional era now where the expectations in place for players and coaches is such that all of our focus and attention has got to be on having the top standards. Later, after the Chelsea Arsenal match, she amended what she said, saying, I didn't think it was right for me to use the term inappropriate for the players. And she said that she regretted making that comment. This is a tough one. Making blanket statements here is really difficult. I don't think that player to player relationships are inappropriate if they're handled how any workplace relationship should be handled. There need to be boundaries set in place, but inherently, I don't believe that they're inappropriate. What happened here is that there is a power struggle in player-coach relationships, and in those situations, it's the responsibility of the organization and the club to protect the players first and foremost. I think Lynn and I both agree the message that we want to send here is that the organization and the club in any workplace has an obligation to protect anybody who's in a vulnerable position. So we support the creation of rules and boundaries that enable that protection to be in place. I agree. Okay. Coming up this weekend, we have NWSL weekend two. Is anybody going to go on a win streak? Is this the return of chaos league? Will there be 23 more goals scored? Yes. And no, <laughs> Again, I I don't know. I think that the league is madness 99.9% of the time. Um, I'm sure somebody will go on a win streak, but I just go bats. Go Portland. bats. One game win streak. Go bats. Let's take a look at some of the big matchups. The weekend kicks off with the Orlando Pride versus Angel City on Friday on Amazon Prime. I'm calling this Amazon Prime Prime Night, 8 p.m. Eastern. Look for Angel City to bounce back off their loss. I I did just want to say, Lynn, wasn't it so cute when Giselle Thompson subbed on for Alyssa? It kind of like reminded me of my first cap when I like subbed onto the field with Chrissy for the national team. I just think the sister story is so cool. I'll never get over it. Giselle is only 18 years old. Alyssa is only 19. They have such bright futures ahead of them. I know. And it's like, it literally is like you and Christy, like one year apart. 
I know. It's so oh, cute. I am so happy for them. Obviously, I feel like they would have wished that it was different circumstances where they were winning, but I thought Giselle came in, showed a little bit of a spark. I'm excited to watch her, and they're just so cute together. I know. I totally agree. They're they're going to be so great. Um, so <laughs> that's Angel City. They're playing Orlando Pride. The Brazilian contingent at Orlando have big expectations on them this season. Marta, Adriana, Angelina, Rafa, Luana. Samantha. Samantha. We could keep going forever. Saturday morning is the Manchester Derby in the Women's Super League. It's on at 8.30 a.m. Eastern on Paramount+. Plus. Man United versus Man City. You guys, I am actually traveling to Manchester to be at the game. I'm so excited about my return. And I just wanted to give a little quick breakdown. What are these derby matches? They're crosstown rivalry games. There's a ton of history on both sides. The men and the women of this one especially. Man City versus Man United is like one of the biggest rivalries in sports. These games are really, really intense. And this game will be played at the Etihad, which is Man City's big stadium, in which I actually never got to play when I was there. So I can't wait to see the atmosphere on Saturday. Like, what are you going to eat? What are you most excited about? My husband, Pat, is very into food. So he's obviously, like, already made some reservations. Um, We are really excited. We definitely want to go to the Chippy. I don't really know. I'm just so excited. There's this really cute coffee shop in this neighborhood called Ann Coates. The coffee shop is called Trove. I'm very excited to go back. I know I'm going to be sending lots of pictures of what I get to Rose because we used to just thrive there. You're going on, like, a nostalgia tour. I know. I really am. Um, I'm really excited about it. So everybody keep your eyes on our socials and on our YouTube. I think there's going to be a ton of content about this weekend. Other NWSL games to note are San Diego versus Kansas City on Saturday night, 10 p.m. Eastern on ION. Can Kansas City do it again and win another game five to four? We'll have to see. Maybe. (laughs) We'll see. And then to close out the weekend, Sunday, 8 p.m. Eastern on ESPN2. It is the first ever... Good Vibes FC Classico. Lynn versus Becky. Thorns versus Gotham. Just a reminder, the Challenge Cup was not a league game. So this is technically Gotham's first league match since winning the championship in 2023. Yeah. First ever Good Vibes FC Classico. Becky, you're going down. Whoa. Boom. Roasted. I think we're going to have to play that back for Becky on audio before the game and see if it get really gets her going. Yeah, probably. Cause that was really, really good. Good. Yeah. Good. Becky, oh. you're going down. She said, uh, okay, folks, it is time now to go to the inbox. If you have a question for us, please write to us at women's game. MIB at men and or call us at eight, five, five, six, one, one, 40, 50. And leave us a question. We will try to answer it here live on the show. Lynn, can you repeat that number for us without looking? Um, 855-611-4050. I didn't look at all. She looked. I didn't. I didn't. This week, we have an email from Robin Smith from California who wrote, Is the fixture congestion this year a worry for those playing both club and international football? Do you have any thoughts? I do have thoughts. I think, yes, like... I think that in a lot of ways, the game is getting more and more professional and female players are having access to more resources and better care and better sports science. But in a lot of ways, it has not caught up as quickly as the match calendar has grown. I think that especially for players who play club and country, there's really no rest. The way the games lay out, like it's really hard on your bodies. And I definitely think that this recent horrible epidemic in ACL tears is partly due to the calendar, the increase in games, the increase in expectations without the same matched increase in resources, but you're playing, you're actually a little bit injured right now. So what do you think? Yeah, I completely agree. I think that on one hand, it's very exciting to mimic the men's calendar, but I don't, I do not think that that we have the resources in place right now. I think that just like you said, there has been an ACL injury epidemic going on in the women's game and the resources just aren't there yet. Traveling in middle seats and playing on turf fields sometimes and all of the things, I think it's really hard on your body trying to find downtime to 
to have your muscles recuperate, to have your just brain recuperate going back and forth. Um, I also just think that it's interesting how late the, the tournaments are being brought to our attention. Um, I think that when you sign contracts, if that's for your club or your country, you are signing them based on X amount of games. And so then when games are added to that, that's 10 more games. That's 15 more games that you didn't put into your contracts. Um, and we all love the game, but we also need to get paid. So it's an interesting, like, well, now I, I'm getting less pay for more work. Yeah. I think that's such an interesting point, Lynn. Like I think for such a long time, the, the responsibility of growing the game has been on the players mm -hmm. and you all have done such an incredible job doing that. And that excuse can't continue to be used. Like, well, this is good for the growth. This is good for the growth. Like not at the expense of everybody's body. No. So I think there's certainly, this is a concern and it's something that I know a lot of really smart people are working on, but we do need to see an improvement in resources or more care when it comes to the calendar. Um, because again, player protection and player safety should be everybody's first priority all the time. I completely agree. Okay. This is the end. This is the end of the episode. Wah. I'm devastated, but I want to leave our amazing friends and listeners with some good vibes. And my good vibe this week is just coming off of this trip to North Carolina, how amazing it felt to be reconnected with some of my old friends, teammates, colleagues. I think that any chance you get to kind of reconnect with people from your past and kind of keep those things that tether you together alive. It's just so important and it can really, even though it feels like maybe um, you're just like living in the past, I think it's really important that those relationships kind of continue to grow into who you are now. And so I'm just feeling really grateful that I had this opportunity to see some old friends and to be recognized at the courage. And um, I would encourage every encourage. I would encourage everybody to maybe like reach out to somebody that they haven't talked to in a while. I think that it can feel really good. I love that. I'm going to riff off that Ooh. and say old friends and friends that you currently have right now are so exciting and you should connect with them, but also reach out to new friends. Ooh. I feel like there is always space to invite somebody new into your life, um, somebody that maybe you didn't expect to have an impact on you. Um, and I would just encourage people to – if you see somebody who looks lonely or somebody who you might not always reach out to, just reach out to them and say, hey, what's up? They might surprise you. We're just the queens of good vibes. <laughs> That's why we're nerds and peanut butter cups. Mm. Opposites that attract. <laughs> maybe we wouldn't have, maybe we wouldn't have reached out, but we did. And now we're besties from the past. So I know. Connection. Past and present and future. Okay, we're going to wrap this one up. That is it for this week's episode of Good Vibes FC. Are you subscribed to this podcast feed yet? If not, subscribe right now, you little munchkin. It's available wherever you listen to podcasts and YouTube and Instagram at Women's Game MIB. This week on Friendlies, dropping Thursday morning, we have an interview with Welsh legend and Seattle Rain midfielder Jess Fishlock. Jess reveals her all-time women's soccer best 11, we also talk about her recent wedding and the heartbreak of Wales not qualifying for the 2023 World Cup. Jess is one of the most interesting and talented footballers I know, and it was so much fun to chat with her. We even swapped stories about that game, Lynn. Do you remember when we lost to Seattle 5-1 to one in our professional debuts? How could I forget? <laughs> I was told it was my fault. Oh, uh. Listen on Thursday to hear that whole story. We will be back next week with an episode of Good Vibes FC with Becky Sauerbrunn. Thank you so much for listening to Good Vibes, uh, the podcast that's like a Hershey's kiss because it is just so freaking cute. Okay. Bye, Lynn. Bye, everybody. I'll text you all in five minutes.